Hello everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. What is a fairy tale? Suppose we say it's a beautiful little story that could never happen. For instance, Cinderella. Impossible. Why? Because of suddenly materializing fairy godmothers? No. Because of pumpkins that turn into coaches and vice versa? Definitely not. All of these are perfectly reasonable. What makes the story a fairy tale is the fact that royal princes do not marry kitchen maids in real life. I want you out of this house at once. Oh, please don't. I have no place to go. That's no concern of mine. Get out before I throw you out. Oh, I, I hate you. Your feelings are of no account to me. I wish you a fate. Worse than death. Mm, I'm sure you do. Oh, you're thinking a, a low, common, ignorant servant girl. What harm can she do? Well, I'll find a way. I swear to you. I'll find a way. Our mystery drama, The Light That Failed, was especially adapted from the Rudyard Kipling classic for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mason Adams and Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The standard engine is a V8. Standard tires, steel-belted radials. There are front and rear stabilizer bars, special springs and shock valving, fast ratio power steering, and a rally steering wheel. What makes all this interesting is that it belongs to a full-size six-passenger Buick, the 1977 LeSabre Sport Coupe. You'll have to drive it to believe it. This is Polly Bergen. I recently witnessed a demonstration of cardiovascular pulmonary resuscitation, CPR. The American Heart Association wants everybody to learn CPR. It only takes a few hours to do so. If most of us know CPR, thousands of lives may be saved each year. Won't you call the American Heart Association and ask about CPR? Support your American Heart Association. We're fighting for your life. Fill her up, Mrs. Austin. Eugene, I think I need new shock absorbers. Have I got a shock for you, Mrs. Austin? The shocks that conquered Mount Kilimanjaro. Only shocks we carry. In fact, these are the shocks I use in my own personal car. That car? Did you right. Mean? The one with the big numbers on the side. You got it. And the wing on the back? Right. Well, why don't we just fill her up, Eugene? I'll have to think about those shock absorbers. You can get shock absorbers anywhere these days. But at Midas, you also get a shock specialist. He tells you whether you really need shocks at all. And if you do... He can choose from any one of our five heavy-duty Midas shocks to make sure you get the right shock for your car and the way you drive. When you need shocks, you need us. Midas, the shock specialist. We have to do a better job. Buy a Midas muffler, muffler and cab set for $4.95, and Midas will donate $1 to Easter Seals. You will feel warm all over helping Easter Seals. story is many things to many people. The truth is that stories have lives of their very own. Sometimes the finished work may even baffle the author. Let us consider a work by Rudyard Kipling. If he were alive today, he might say, what's going on here? Well, Rudyard, what's going on is what you put in. However, we have taken the same poetic license with your story that you took with life. So, the time is 1882. The place is what used to be called the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. 
The narrator is Gilbert Belling Torpenhow, a foreign correspondent for a string of British newspapers. I first met Dick Heldar in what was supposed to be the safety of the interior of a hollow square. You know, that's, that's how the troops line up to repel an attack from all sides. The war correspondents, the doctor, all the folk who were useless during combat found themselves in the middle. But the crazed and fanatic followers of the Mahdi had broken through at several points, and so all of us had to pick up weapons and fight for our lives. I was standing shoulder to shoulder with a young man about my own age, and both of us were hacking away with sabers for dear life. Look out! I got him! On your left! I see him! Don't pull your arm back so far! What did you say? Duck! Above my arm! You exposed too much of yourself! Thanks. Look out! We'll get out. On your right! On your right! What? I was too late. A huge tribesman bleeding from a multitude of wounds had brought a heavy sword down across the young man's head. But only because the native was mortally wounded had the sword turned in his hand so that the young man caught the flat of it instead of the edge. Amazing. Amazing. Who is that, Maisie? Thank you, Maisie, for the drink and for tying up my head. Oh. Huh? What? You can thank me for the drink and the doctor for the bandage. Where, where am I? Where are you? Well, you're not back in dear old London, that's for certain. Oh, what happened? You are in the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, near a hellhole entitled Suakin. What are you doing here? Gilbert Belling Torvan, our special correspondent of the Southern Newspaper Syndicate. Oh. Oh, oh, is it? Well, could they have a war without the likes of me? <laughs> I, uh, I suppose so. You suppose so. Without me, your British public wouldn't know what was happening. And what they don't know doesn't exist. Ergo, quote, erat demonstratum, or whatever. Without me, the war wouldn't exist. Oh, oh, you're the... Gilbert Belling Torpenhow. Guilty as charged, but you must call me Torp. And what shall I call you? Dick. Dick Helder. Well, you're not a soldier. You're not a correspondent. What are you doing out here? I'm, uh, I'm an artist. Well, then, why aren't you back in a studio in London drinking champagne with nude models? I want to paint the war. Oh, I hope my head's going to stay on. I wonder if I can get up. Well, the doctor says you shouldn't try for a while. There. Oh, it's still there. What? My bag. Look, look inside. You'll find some sketches. I looked. And I saw, for the first time, I was the first to see the war sketches of Dick Helder. I'm not a critic. Far from it. But what I saw, I knew was good. Not just good, but great. The man was a genius. Because this was the war. This was the truth. A star shell bursting above the camp. A slave now being captured by a British gunboat. A single soldier lying dead in the moonlight with his throat cut. Dozens, scores of sketches, drawings, watercolor, sanguines. It was the war and the men who made it. At rest, at work, drinking, fighting, killing, and being killed. Yes, this was the war. I would write a thousand words to describe imperfectly what he could delineate with a single stroke of a pen or a brush. Well, uh, what, uh, what do you think? I've seen worse. Do you have any money? No, not too much. My syndicate may be interested in taking on a war artist. Would they? I don't suppose you care much what you get. Well, money is really very unimportant. Oh, fine, because they'll pay practically nothing. They'll take advantage of you. Uh, what I want is my first chance. Well, I'll see what I can do. As soon as I could, I wired the syndicate. I've got a man here, a great artist. And they replied, with their usual open-hearted generosity, we'll take him on trial, expenses only, send all his sketches. I knew I'd get my chance. Sorry, so little money. Oh, if I come through this business alive, they'll sweat for it. They'll all sweat for it. All? Everybody. What's everybody got to do with it? Well, I've worked for nothing all my life. <laughs> Your life has only begun. Sometimes I feel as though I've lived forever. Since the beginning of time, I feel that old. You don't look it. As I'll show them, everybody. And I must have lots of money. Why? Well, because it's no good without it. Money. That's what counts. And what about art? You worry about art, and I'll worry about money. And between us, we'll carry on to victory. 
I owe you a favor. The assignment from my syndicate? It may turn out to be a terrible disservice. Oh, no. Look, let's not talk about favors. In all that cutting and hacking during the last attack, we saved each other more times than we can count. What? Where are you going? To the telegraph office. And what for? I shan't tell you. You'd object. To what? To what I intend to do. You're a man of scruples. And you're not? I am an artist. Which means what? I do what has to be done. You have a bottle of whiskey your uncle sent you from London. The doctor says it's too soon after your cloud across the head for you to think of whiskey. It isn't for me. It's for someone else. And don't ask for who, because I shall not tell you. Well, then you can't have the bottle. I won't aid or abet you in committing what I know is going to be a sin. It will be something sinful, won't it? Well, you would consider it sinful, I suppose. But you could prevent me from committing another sin, that of robbery... Because if you don't give me the whiskey, I shall steal it from your kit. Oh, no, you won't, because I intend to guard it day and night. Oh, you're no match for me, Torp. You see, I was raised in a foster home by a Mrs. Janet. Janet? Isn't a Janet a kind of a donkey? Yes, yes. She had the mind and the morals of a female donkey, too. And when she hit you, you felt as if you were kicked by one. She was very um, economical. So Maisie and I... Maisie? Maisie, I've heard that name before. Another little foster girl. We helped each other survive by stealing food under Mrs. Janet's nose. And what happened to Maisie? I could probably steal that bottle of whiskey from your kit while you're looking at me. All right, take it. I'm doing this for you. Uh, I shudder to think of it. A rather odd one, that Dick Helder. But he was a genius. Well, that sort has to be human. And Maisie? Maisie. Who was Maisie? Hers was the name that he kept repeating while he was delirious. Well, I'd get that out of him eventually. But now for the present problem. Why did he want to bring a bottle of whiskey to the telegraph office? I decided to see for myself. Hello, Torp. Just in time. He's out cold. Why did you want to get the telegraph operator drunk? So I could get these. What? What's that? Papers. Trelawney's dispatches. The exclusive interview with Lord Kitchener. We're in luck. Our friend on the floor hasn't sent him yet. Read him. That's not really ethical. It's not ethical or it's not really ethical. Well, they belong to Trelawney. Or what right is Trelawney to an exclusive interview with the Commander-in-Chief? What right is Trelawney to be here in the first place? Why, the man can hardly write his name. But still, he... It's only because Trelawney Sr. is a high muckamuck in the war office. Influence, influence. I can't steal it and say Kitchener gave me the interview. No, but uh, you can read it, you can make sense of it, you can extract the facts from it, and you can send it out as your impressions of the progress of the war. Oh, now, Dick, and Kitchener will say, who is this Torpenhow with his fantastic insight into my very own brain? (laughs) If you tempt me. If Trelawney were actually a war correspondent, if he deserved to be considered a writer. Besides, all's fair in love and war. I confess I didn't need too much more convincing. I thoroughly despised Malcolm Trelawney. I must say the article that appeared under my byline the following week was the making of me as a correspondent. Till this point, I was young and promising. Now, I had arrived. I was mature. A great practitioner of my art. And, heaven forgive me, I ate it up. But this isn't my story. It's Dick Heldar's. So, the war ended. We were all sent home. Dick had also achieved fame. His war sketches had caught the public fancy. We took rooms together in Mayfair. I shall have my share of the rent before the week's out. Wish you wouldn't worry about it. You have a reputation. You can sell anything you do from here on. You'll make a fortune. I already have a fortune. You do? All those sketches. Close to 150. They're mine. I can sell them immediately. Well, Dick... Well, Dick, what? I already can count on 15,000 pounds. What do you think 15,000 is too optimistic? No, it may even be on the low side. (laughs) Well, then what are you talking about? Hmm... Probably some acquaintance or other stopping in for a drink. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you, sir, you, 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 you do live on a 
high floor. Seven stories high, but seven is a lucky number. My stars, I must say so. Have I uh, the honor of addressing Mr. Dick Well, uh, the honor is dubious. Enter. My name is Hubertus Valdemar. I am the head of the Southern Newspaper Syndicate. Ah, oh, a man I most devoutly wish to see. Have a chair, Mr. Uh, Valdemar. Valdemar, V A L. Yes, that's what I said, uh, Valdemar. Uh, this is Mr. Uh, Torpenhauer. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I also admire Mr. Torpenhauer. Oh, no. I <coughs> am here, Mr. Heldar, to discuss our future business relationships. Uh, well, any future relationship must necessarily be more expensive than the past. Oh, you'll find us most generous. I hope so. I haven't up until now. Uh, incidentally, uh, be good enough to send my sketches to this address. Your sketches? By actual count, 150. Oh, Mr. Hilda, that cannot be done. It cannot? Since there was no specified agreement at the outset, the sketches become syndicate property as a matter of course. Those sketches belong to me. But a legal evaluation... The devil with your legality, Mr. Valdemar. Valdemar. You paid me the lowest rate in the world. Nothing. You can't keep those sketches. Good Lord, man, they're all I have. Talk. Can he do it? Well, it's a rather cold-blooded steal on his part, but... Yes, Dick, he can do it. I'll have his blood first. Careful, Dick. Remember, we're not back in the Sudan. Sir... You will give me back my pictures. I uh, believe it's time I was on my way. Sit down. How dare you take your hands off me? Dick, you can't simply... I don't know quite what to do with you. Of course, you're a thief and you want to be whipped. Take your hands off me. I'll shout for help. You're seven stories high. My goodness, Torp, you wouldn't believe the fat on this one. You are going to steal the things from me, which are as my heart's blood. You... Who don't know when you will die. Die? Die? Write a note to your office. Order them to give Mr. Torpenhow my sketches. Every one of them. You have no right to, to steal. Oh, no. Only you do. Write the note or I shall strip off your hide. Dick, you can't do oh, that. can't I? Watch closely. I learned how. I can't let you do that. Huh. Do you want to fight me for it, all? Dick, Dick. Should one of us be compelled to kill the other just because of this thieving jackal? Who knows? But it's precisely on such random, unforeseen twists of fate that sudden violence and death flare up without warning. We're accustomed to considering the artist as a creator, but in Dick Heldar, do we see the artist as the killer? Both Dick and Torp are young men who have been subject to the searing acids of deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat. What does this do to the soul? I'll continue with Act Two shortly. Here in my hand is a little capsule. It's contact. It contains enough cold medicine to help relieve cold symptoms caused by every known virus. Think about that the next time you're sick. Sneezing, dripping, all clogged up. Then let us help you with real medicine, like contact. We're number one in the whole world. Give your cold to contact. Real medicine for real cold. Take only as direct. How does your laxative work? Many brand name laxatives contain ingredients that expand in your stomach. That's how they work. We know a medicine that works differently. It's in the X-Lax pill. Overnight, the X-Lax pill gently stimulates your system's own regular rhythm. Stimulates your system for relief in the morning. No surprises, just relief in the morning. That's the X-Lax pill. Try it tonight with confidence. For occasional use only as directed, X-Lax pills. <laughs> Your child will learn to read more quickly if you help him to observe and be aware of his surroundings. Here's a way to help him do this while having fun at the same time. Have him draw a map of the room he is in. Explain what a map is and that it's used for helping people find things or places. Tell him to put in the chairs, windows, doors, tables, stoves, or anything else there that he thinks is important. He can also see how big the room is by measuring with his own feet. If he can't count that high yet, you should help him. He can then draw maps of 
other rooms or of the whole house. Don't worry if the objects are out of proportion. He's learning by doing. And with practice and your gentle guidance, he's learning about spatial relationships. Listen for other new approach method, reading hints to parents furnished as a public service by this radio station. For other ways you can help your child, write New Approach Method Incorporated, Post Office Box 1303, Trenton, New Jersey, 08607. whom does the work of art belong? To the man who made it or to the man who bought it? This is a question that has occasioned considerable grief in this world and is about to add a bit more as we resume our drama. Dick Haldar, the painter, wants his pictures. Mr. Valdemar, the publisher, claims he bought them. An old argument. But a razor-sharp knife has appeared in Dick's hand and we may have a new solution to the problem. He, he, he'll kill me, this maniac. He'll kill me. I must remind you once again, Dick, we're not back in the Sudan. Oh, we're always in the Sudan, Torp. Here the violence is better bred, hidden deeper, camouflaged more cleverly. But where is the real difference? Torp is a friend. You have to help me. I can't help you kill him. Oh, I can do that alone quite nicely, thank you. Don't. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. No, of course not. Hand him the pen and paper, Top. Now, Mr. Valdemar, you will write a note to your office and order them to give Mr. Torpenhow my sketches. He didn't say a word. He looked deep into Dick's eyes and there he saw death. He picked up the pen with a hand that was remarkably steady considering the circumstances. He wrote the note. I took a cab to the Southern Newspaper Syndicate's office. I gave it to some functionary or other, and I shortly received a gigantic portfolio. I brought it back to the flat. Now, I do hope this will be a lesson to you, Mr. Valdemar. And should you ever worry me later with any nonsensical actions for assault or whatever, believe me, I'll catch you. Manhandle you, and you will die. Now go. Vanish. Disappear. Out! Be sure I have seen the last of you, Mr. Vademar. Valdemar! <laughs> what a lawless breed these people are. Think of the hideous blackness of that man's mind. Have you all the sketches, Top? Exactly 147. Hmm. Well, that's close enough. Dick, I must say, you begin well. He was interfering with me, Top. Well, what did the money mean to him? He's a man of wealth. But this is my work. It's everything to me, and he was going to steal them. I'm sorry now I didn't hit him. I should have killed him. The commissions began coming in so quickly, Dick could hardly keep track of them. The ladies, especially the ladies, couldn't get enough of them. He had that way of making their eyes gaze forth in a kind of dreamy reverie. Yes, every female wants to be known as a woman of mystery. And with one sure stroke, Dick could give them a most unfathomable air. I caught him finally on one of the rare nights when he wasn't being lionized somewhere. Well, how does success taste, Dick? Good. No, delicious. <laughs> I want more. More. The lean years are past, gone for good, but never to be forgotten. Oh, I shall wallow in these fat ones. Careful, my friend. That way lies bad work. Oh, I love the power, the fun, the fuss. And above all, I love the money. Hmm. Even though the people who make the fuss and pay the money are a queer gang... An amazingly queer lot. Well, I should think you have enough money now. Oh, no, no, no. Nowhere near enough. Well, then, Dick, you must tell me, what is enough? There are those men who have money, and then there are those men who have a fortune. And why would you want a fortune? For her. For whom? For Maisie. Oh, huh? the mysterious Maisie. She won't have me until I'm fabulously wealthy and famous. Well, you're famous at any rate. Well, just a little... We need the test of time for that. And where is Maisie? I don't know. We were both boarded children at uh, Mrs. Jennett's. I fell in love with her. Did she fall in love with you? She said she would, in time, if I became rich and famous. 
then she would seek me out. I'm surprised she hasn't so far. Well, that's because I'm neither rich enough nor famous enough. And how will you know when that will be? Simple. On the day she seeks me out. Meanwhile, I must try harder and harder. Tell me something about Maisie. She's an angel. And why aren't you good enough for her now? So, you don't understand. All right, all right, then. Tell me this. Maisie. Maisie, does she really exist? I couldn't get a rise out of him. He was doing what he wanted to do, turning out paintings as if he were a printing press. But it was a bubble that soon must burst. His work was becoming inferior. But you couldn't tell him anything. At least I couldn't. But finally, somebody did. Someone who never dreamed he was an expert on art. Someone I can only refer to as the unknown soldier. The, the way of it was this. We were out for a stroll, and we paused before the window of a print shop. There was a reproduction, a good one, of a painting by Dick, one that he had done in the Sudan. It was the wild, whirling rush of a field battery going into action under fire. As we gazed at it, I could hear a voice. And from the corner of my eye, I saw two artillery soldiers, and one was saying to the other, Oh, they've chucked off the lead horse. He's tore up awful. But they're making good time with the others. That lead driver drives better than you, Tom. See how cunning he's nursing his horse. See how his foot's braced against the iron. He's all right. I'm a beggar what drew that picture. He knows what's what. He does. Now, let's go in and buy it for the mess. The picture won the complete approval of the sternest critics in the world. For a long moment, Dick looked at it, and then he cleared his throat. He had been moved in a way that I hadn't seen since the Sudan. We walked home in silence. When we arrived at our entranceway, there was a girl standing at the door. She had blonde hair, a cheap little sailor hat, and a rather soiled blue and white dress. She stood there and gazed at us. Suddenly, Dick shouted, Maisie! Maisie! What are you saying, Dick? You... You mean... This is Maisie. Oh, here now. Who do you take me for? Maisie, you've come to me. Oh, oh no, 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 no. It's not Maisie. Dick. She looks, uh, she looks exactly like Maisie. Who are you, girl? Who are you? She's I, going I, to faint. I, Dick, don't let her fall. Uh, what are we going to do with that? Perhaps we'd better bring her upstairs. A girl of her sort. What sort? Well, isn't it obvious? Uh, and she must be drunk. No, I'd say she's hungry. She's starved. Oh, still, it's out of the qu All right. Yes, bring her up. Shoe model for me. Yes, this is... This is going to be my masterpiece. I won't title it. But Maisie will see it and know who it's meant to be. Torp, this girl was sent from heaven. I must put her on canvas. Are you feeling better? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, there aren't many gentlemen that are as kind as you are. Thank you. Uh, when did you leave service? Oh, well, how'd you know I was in service? Well, you're scarred and uh, chapped hands. Uh... Oh, well, I didn't like it. Turn your face to the window. Uh, what for? Because I say so. Listen to me. I'm an artist. I want to draw your head. What for? Because it's pretty. Huh? Uh, that's why you shall come here three times a week. And just for sitting still, I shall give you three quid each Friday. J just for sitting still? Nothing else? What's your name? Oh, Bessie. Bessie Broke. Stone Broke, if you like. What's your names? Oh, but there, no man ever gave me his real one yet. And the next time uh, you come, Bessie, you needn't wear that paint. I have all the colors you're likely to need. Now, here's a sovereign to keep you. A sovereign? For me? Yes. <sighs> and you'll be here tomorrow. Understand? Now, off with you. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. You think she'll be back? Of course. She smells money. And talk. You're not to think of her as a woman. She's my model. Nothing more. Oh, yes, sir. I will, sir. I said earlier that this is Dick Heldar's story. Well, it is. But part of it is mine. Bessie came back the next day, unpainted, clean. And when she found out that all she was expected to do was merely pose, a new light came into her eyes. And finally, one day she said... Oh, it's too much money for sitting and doing nothing. Well, you just sit there quietly now. Well, can't 
I'd be doing something with my hands. Well, keep them folded in your lap. I know. I meant your socks. Yours and Mr. Torpenhouse. And that's where it all began. She not only mended our socks, she did our clothes. She dusted the rooms. Indeed, she hated to go home. She kept finding things to do. Dick treated her like dirt. That is, he never noticed her except as a model. But I couldn't help noticing how attractive she really was. How tender, how sympathetic. Dick would finish painting and go for a walk, but I would be in my room, writing. She would knock timidly and come in, ask me questions. So wanted to improve herself. And something was happening. Happening to me. She's only a girl from the slums, no breeding, no education. Yet I couldn't help thinking that no other girl had ever really moved me. She sensed it. One day we were alone in the house. She brought me my socks, and as she handed them to me, and her fingers brushed against mine, before I knew it, she was in my arms. We were holding each other tightly, and we kissed. <sighs> oh. Yes. oh, sir. Sir, it, it isn't right for me to let you, but I can't help it. You're so kind. Bessie, I do. I do feel great affection for you. Oh, sir. But, Bessie... I could oh, never... Mr. Torpenhow, I, I'm not asking you to marry me. I know my place, but couldn't you take and live with me till your very own Miss Wright comes along? I'm only Miss Wrong, I know. I, I could never be anything else, but... Oh, I I'd work my hands to the bone for you. I'm not ugly to look at, you know. I'm so lonely. Oh, please, say you will. Oh, what? Oh. Come in here. I need you. Uh, it's Dick. Oh, what, what does he want? He, he wants to see me. Oh, tell him. Tell, tell him you'll see him later. Oh. oh, don't go to him now. Please. He'll ruin it. That's what he'll do. Ruin it. Oh, Bessie, my dear, I'll be right back. No, wait. Oh, what kind of foolishness is going on in here? What the devil right of you to interfere? Doesn't your own common sense tell you it's impossible? For heaven's sake, Thorpe, whatever got into you? Dick, I oughtn't to have seen her moving about in these rooms like a housewife. It it, it gives a, a lonely man ideas. Yes, yes, and you've got to get rid of those ideas. Do you know how? Oh, Dick, I wish I did. Well, you're going to Germany to do a series on the army maneuvers tonight. Now, you can't stay and resist the devil. Success requires flight. Immediately. Pack your bag. Oh, Mr. Torpenhow, you, you're not leaving. Yes, he has a special assignment. I'm asking him. And I'm answering. Oh, please. You may leave now, Bessie. Be back here tomorrow at 11 sharp. Oh, I hate you. And your feelings are of no account to me. You'll pay for what you've done to me. Bessie. Bessie, I do have to leave. I do. Oh, you, you took away my only chance for happiness, Mr. Eldar. But you'll pay. Oh, you're thinking, she's only a low and common girl. What can she do to a gentleman like me? But I'll find something. I'll do something. Something worse than death. It doesn't matter who or what the woman is. If she threatens vengeance, take her seriously. For women excel at this particular game. And before the third act is over, she will have found her revenge. A diabolical revenge that will be something worse than death. Let's all prepare for it. And I shall return with it in just a few moments. The 1977 Buick Regal. It comes with Buick's terrific V6 engine. It carries six people and lots of Buick comfort. It's lean. It's maneuverable in city traffic. It's the most luxurious mid-sized car Buick builds. Yeah, this new Regal is pretty much everything a car should be. Except for one thing. It isn't yours yet. But it can be. Just see your Buick dealer for a test drive. Soon. Hey, what's gotten into you lately anyway? Dust? <coughs> Vapors? <coughs> gases? Toxins? <laughs> Watch what you breathe on the job. Be careful of air full of residue. If you want to keep working, remember this. Your lungs must keep on working, too. Use your head. Save your lungs. Your local lung association considers it a matter of life and breath. 
Spring cleaning time is approaching, so now's the time to take advantage of the March bargain of the month from True Value Hardware Stores. It's the Quaker Four Shelf Extra Heavy Duty Shelving Unit. It's handy in the workshop, laundry room, garage, anywhere that could use a little organization. This month it's just $9.99 at True Value Hardware Stores. The W-shaped posts are stronger than the standard X-angle iron posts, and the new V-shaped sway braces at the sides and back add extra strength. Securely store tools, paint, laundry soap, or just about anything on one of the four adjustable shelves. The whole unit is 30 inches wide, almost 5 feet high, and extra deep, 16 inches. Get the Quaker four shelf unit for just $9.99. It's the March bargain of the month while supplies last at participating True Value Hardware Stores. True Value Hardware, it's more than just a name. WBBM Chicago. A fate worse than death. What could be a fate worse than death? That would depend on who you are. Uh, before we speculate further, let us remember that the threat has been made by a very insignificant low-class servant girl. And while these distinctions may be blurred or even non-existent in our democratic society, our story takes place in Victorian England. And here is our storyteller once again, Gilbert Torpenhow. Well, of course it was madness on my part. Complete madness, a sudden seizure. How could I possibly marry a girl like Bessie? After a few days, I returned home. I didn't know what to expect. But there was Bessie posing as if nothing had happened. And there was Dick painting, as usual. Dick. Dick, it's magnificent. Quiet, quiet. I have to catch this little shot. I can't be quiet. I can't. This, this, why, this is Bessie. Oh, no. No, it's Maisie. It's amazing. You haven't painted like this since the Sudan. You didn't paint like this even in the Sudan. This is a masterpiece. Oh, confound you, Torp. You've broken my concentration. Oh, Bessie. Hello, Bessie. Hmm. Be here 11 sharp tomorrow, you hear? Doesn't say much, does she? No. And it's a blessed relief. Oh, how she must hate us both. Doesn't matter. So, you like it. Oh, this picture will make you. <laughs> I thought I was made already. I mean, as a real artist, not just a realistic painter of war pictures yeah. or a smooth society hack, but an artist. I will be an artist on the day that Maisie sees that picture because that's the day she'll come to see me and she'll be mine. I hope so, Dick. Damn. What is it? For a moment, I thought I had a... Veil across my eyes. A veil? Oh, it's just the... Just the flimsiest, gauze-like veil. It's probably indigestion. Indigestion does that. Hadn't you better see a doctor? I don't have time. Nonsense, man. You must make time. He would never have gone on his own, so I made an appointment with a doctor, a specialist. After much argument, I finally dragged him to the man's office. He was a very cheerful doctor. He chirped like a sparrow. Well, Mr. Helder, you know we all need a bit of patching now and then. Like a ship. Exactly like a ship. We must be kept ship-shape. What? <laughs> uh, I think, Doctor, I have neglected the warnings of the stomach too long. Hence these spots before my eyes. Oh, is that what you think? Absolutely. Well, here I was under the impression that you came to find out what I think. Yes, by all means. Go ahead. Thank you. This wound, this blow you received in the fighting in the Sudan. Oh, that hasn't bothered me in years. Well, there was damage to the optic nerve and the bright, hot light of the topic. Doctor, if there is a verdict, I want it immediately. Well? I am a painter. I have no time to waste. Tell me. Uh, well, there has been steady, irreversible deterioration of the optic nerve. And I'm going blind. Yes, Absolutely, completely, totally blind. Yes. How long do I have? If you avoid all strain and anxiety, perhaps uh, a year. 
You must stop painting the strain of the close work it requires. I see. I must stop painting in order to keep my sight a little bit longer. Hmm? Yes. What good is my sight if I can't paint? All the way home, we didn't say a word. We simply didn't talk about it. We couldn't. When we arrived at the flat, Bessie was waiting as usual, silent as usual. Dick picked up his brushes and began to work. Are you almost finished with it, Dick? Oh, yes, yes, I have just enough time for that. It's simply a great piece of work, Dick. Oh, these past few weeks, it seems I've never seen color so clearly and line so sharply. I suppose it's, it's like a candle which burns out. Just before the end, it sputters and flares for a brief instant. This is my brief moment. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And it's Bessie. No. It's Maisie. She'll see it. That's what I live for now. He painted for a few moments longer. And then he put down his brushes. His face had become lined with fatigue. Now I noticed the lines about his eyes. He tired so easily. He stood staring at nothing for a moment. And then... It'll be enough for today. Bessie, I want you back here tomorrow morning at 11 sharp. So, I think I'll lie down before dinner. How have you been, Bessie? Oh, as well as can be expected. I wonder that you came back after the shabby way both Mr. Heldar and I have treated you. Well, the wages are good. Girl in my position can't afford to be particular... He's going blind, ain't he? Yes. Well, he can thank me for it. Or curse me for it. You? I wished it on him. As I prayed for it to happen to him. What else could be a fate worse than death for an artist? I went to church and on my knees I prayed for it. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Bessie. It wasn't your doing. How do you know? I was there when it happened in the Sudan. A blow across the head damaged the optic nerve. Oh, yes? Well, we'll all think of something else. You had better go, Bessie. I saw her standing there furious. Her face was ugly. Whatever the spell was she might have cast over me, it was broken. And for all time, I was free of her. And soon, in a day or two or three, Dick would be finished with the painting, and he would be free of her, too. I must tell you what happened. A week later, I was writing in my room... When I heard him call to me. Tor! Tor! Come in here, quick! Look, Torp. Look, it's finished. It's really finished. Oh, Dick. Dick, it is marvelous. It's your masterpiece. Oh, the colors, the colors. Tell me about the colors. See for yourself. They're remarkably but brilliant. I, I can't see for myself. I, I can't. Dick, I'm blind, Torp. I'm completely blind. I drew the last stroke of a brush as I signed my name, and the light left my eyes. The light failed. It failed me. Oh, Dick, how can I? No tears. Only blindness. We've seen worse, haven't we, old friend? Will you... Will you sort of uh, guide me to my room and help me to lie down? I'm not used to being without my eyes just yet. Oh, Bessie, we're finished. Torp, write her a check for 20 pounds. Tw 20 pounds? Yes, yes, she was a good model. Come, I, I have the checkbook in my room. Goodbye, Bessie. Goodbye, Mr. Heldar. Come, Thorp. I, I must lie down. I'm so tired. Oh, that's it, Torp. Oh, I can stretch out. It's so good to know it's done. Now, look, tomorrow, you're to take it to the Stetson Gallery. Yes, yes, of course, Dick. <laughs> Word of it will get to Maisie. I'm sure. And, um, and cover the picture. Yes. Oh, wake me for dinner. We must celebrate. Champagne. Yes, yes, of course. I left him sleeping on his bed and walked back into the studio. I stood in the doorway and looked at the painting. For just a moment... 
an isolated moment, I refused to believe what I was seeing. She was standing there with a bottle of turpentine in one hand and a pallet knife in the other. She was throwing the turpentine onto the picture and scraping away with the knife. And then, like one awake suddenly from a trance, I ran to her. But it was too late. Even as I grabbed her hands and locked away the bottle and the knife, I could see the painting was formless, scarred, a muddle of crazy colors. I was ready to kill her. You raise a hand to me and I'll scream. Scream away, you slut. I'll scream what I've done to his precious picture. He'd like that, wouldn't he? Why, you... He was never found out, right? Never. How could you do that? Why not? I said I wished him a fate worse than death. Well, maybe he don't know it, but he's got it. He's got it. And what have you got, you poor demented creature? Oh, you could What'll become of you now? You'll go back to the gutter. He said you was to give me 20 pounds. Yes, I will. And when that's done... I'll find another gentleman. Will you? I'll still have my looks. Do you? Hmm? Look. Look at yourself in the mirror. Go ahead. Look. What happened to me? What happened to the picture? A twisted, ugly mass. Who'd want you now for anything at all? You'll die in the gutter. Oh, no, no. I didn't mean to. I was so... Oh, please. Maisie. Uh, Maisie. Dick, Dick, look out. You'll stumble over that chair. Here, here. Let, let me hold your arm. It's Maisie. She's here, isn't she? Maisie. You've come. I know it. As soon as the picture was finished, you'd come. You couldn't keep away. Dick, let me help you sit down. Maisie. Oh, where's Maisie? I just heard a voice in here. Maisie. What do you think of your portrait? Maisie. Dick. No, 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 no. No, no. Let her think. Let her regard it. That's what you have to do with a picture. Regard it. Oh, Maisie. When we were children at Mrs. Jeanette's, I helped you. And now you will help me. Oh, my darling. I have enough money. Enough to keep us happy for the rest of our lives. Maisie, I'll be so good to you. And you'll be so good to me. Maisie, speak to me. S say you will. Say it. Say that you've come to me at last. Oh, Maisie, I've waited a lifetime for you. I'd all but given up hope. But I knew if I poured out my soul over this portrait, you would come to me. Tell me you've come to me. Tell me. Yes, Dick. I... I've come to you. <laughs> Taking everything into consideration, would you say we've had a happy ending? It's a complex situation, almost as complicated as happiness itself. However, one thing we do seem to provide, and that is the old saying, love is blind. I shall return shortly. What if... What if you were swept up in disaster? Bring the other hand up before you lose the second one. What if you were young and blind and wanted to learn to swim? That's it. Just refreshing. What if your father were dying and I'm needed blood? Help! Hey, mister! Help! What if your kid were drowning? What if you were old and alone and needed help? And what if... What if nobody cared? But somebody does. And the things Red Cross cares about cost a lot of money. But we think life is worth it, don't you? We're counting on you. When a hurricane is brewing, when an old man needs a friend, where there's suffering, where there's trouble, there's a friend you can depend on. Red Cross is the good neighbor, the good neighbor is you. said this would be a fairy tale, and it is. 
a handsome prince, and Dick was certainly handsome, and a prince of painting, at any rate, he did marry the little servant girl. At least I think they married. Living together, unblessed by clergy, was in those days a scandal. I don't know how things worked out. After all, you have imagination, too. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Mason Adams, Bryna Rayburn, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You see those bright green spots scattered thickly over it? Ah, yes. Yes, they seem more fertile than the rest. Well, you might say that. <laughs> but in reality... That's the great Grimp and Meyer. One false step for man or beast, and you die slowly and agonizingly in the quicksand. An awful place, Doctor. And yet, I find my way to the very heart of it safely. Well, why would you want to go to such a place? That's where the rarest plants and butterflies are. And I have the wit to reach them. Oh! Good Lord, what was that? Uh, the natives say it's the hound of the Baskervilles calling for its prey. Well, you don't believe that, do you? Perhaps it's the mud settling in the bog. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Exlax. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. open when you're busy and closed when you're not, Northwest Federal Savings knows that a good place to save is ready for you when you're ready. Ready with the answers and advice given by professionals in helping thousands just like you, but each with different individual needs. Northwest Federal's professionals can show you, too, the best way to save for a new home, college education, or retirement. Northwest Federal's counselors can explain all the savings plans and help you set up a savings program to meet your special needs. Home loan specialists can tailor a home loan plan to help make your dreams a reality. Bring your needs to any of five convenient Northwest Federal Savings Centers throughout Chicagoland's great Northwest Territory. If you think your needs are special, so does Northwest Federal Savings. All the time. Because Northwest Federal Savings keeps the best hours yours. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week.